on News Hour tonight. Five more bodies recovered from Riva Rima days after a canoe capsizes with over 30 passengers in Sokoto State. Gombe confirms diphtheria case urges vaccination amid residents' concerns over indiscriminate waste disposal. President Tinubu chairs first Council of State meeting approves 300% pay increase for judicial officers. Away from Nigeria, death toll from Uganda garbage landslide climbs to 25. Hello and welcome to the News Hour tonight on Trust Television. I am Aisha Salihu. Five more corpses have been recovered from the River Rima two days after a canoe capsized with over 30 passengers in Sokoto State. The recent recovery brings the total number of lives lost in the incident to 16, according to a traditional ruler, Koguna Dundaye Sagir Bala. Trustee Vis Yushao Adamu visited the village and filed in this report. This is the canoe that capsized in Dundaye village of Sokoto State with over 30 passengers, mostly women, children, and aged people. So far, 16 persons have been confirmed dead, while several others sustained minor injuries. Although this is the second time we are experiencing this kind of disaster in this area. However, this is the worst because it involves death. Even today, five more corpses were recovered, making the total number of people died to 16, and the search operation is still in progress. The 26 feet boat capsized as its driver, Muhammad Awal, was trying to return to the river bank, having foreseen danger ahead. Shortly after it capsized, some river workers swung into action to rescue those who were in the boat. Their effort led to the rescue of several women and aged people. Two people among the passengers that can swim played a greater role in the rescue operation. They helped us in carrying others to the river bank. Following the unfortunate incidents, commercial and private canoe drivers in the area had adopted preventive measures against future boat mishap. We have realized that some passengers have developed the habit of insisting on squatting, even if a boat is full. I want to make it clear that henceforth we will regulate the number of passengers that should join our boats, and any passenger that break our rules will be reported to the appropriate authority. Despite these measures, it was observed that residents of the area are in dire need of government intervention through the prohibitions of modern boats, safety kits, and training to safeguard their lives. Yusho Adamo, Trust TV News, Sokoto. And to health matters, the Gombe State Commissioner of Health, Dr. Habu Dahiru, has announced that the State Public Health Emergency Operations Center has been placed on a lot following a confirmed and suspected cases of diphtheria in Herwagana ward. The hero disclosed that the state has recorded three suspected cases and one confirmed case of diphtheria. He confirmed the availability of vaccines for diphtheria prevention, especially for children at primary health care centers across Gombe State, and urged parents and guardians to ensure prompt vaccination of their children to safeguard them from the potentially fatal disease. The commissioner called for heightened awareness and proactive measures to contain the spread of diphtheria in the affected areas. He said the confirmed case indicated that the affected child had not been immunized against diphtheria, pertussis, and tetanus, which come together in one vaccine, preventable through the pentavalent vaccine administered three times to protect against childhood killer diseases. The indiscriminate dumping of refuse into water channels has been identified as one of the factors contributing to environmental hazards. The act, according to residents, is causing environmental problems like flooding and, by extension, disease outbreaks in Kumbe. Residents are, however, urging the state government to identify such people and make them face the wrath of the law to serve as a deterrent to others. Hassan Kohli has more. 
Dumping of refuse into water channels have for a long time been among the most contributing factors to environmental hazards. Despite numerous efforts to inform people about its negative impact, as well as the contribution of waste collection centers in Gombe metropolitan area, some people continue to dump refuse into drainages. For me, a lot of people are used to doing this without knowing it is leaks. People must desist from dumping refuse in drainages to avert further consequences. Let the government intensify its orientation campaign so that the issue will be dealt with. Refuse dumping in water drainages not affect the person who did it. It also affects the community too, which is taboo because it is against our religion and culture to harm your neighbor. And when one dumps refuse on drainage, it will block waterways, resulting in flooding and disease outbreaks, especially during the rainy season. Therefore, I urge people to dispose their refuse at government approved sites. With the state forecasted to experience flood this year, the Gombe State Government says it will ensure that all violators of environmental laws are severely punished since it has already provided waste collection centers in the metropolitan area. We must uh, call the attention of the public to make sure that uh, uh, the disease from taking waste to the drainages and to stop this open defecation in an area where it's over Eastern mostly. So we go on and engaging them and sensitizing them to stop this. And this is the penalty. Looking at the scenario and looking at the uh, situation and the economy realities in the country, we decided that to, to be flexible in the payment of uh, these penalties because we need to make sure that uh, we, we penalize somebody that, that no matter the gravity of the offense, we penalize it according to how affordable the money will be and we send you to the dollar revenue for payment. When you pay, you come back and present the receipt for us. Then we'll go to the security agencies for proper documentation and for an agreement between you and you that you will stop it henceforth. According to environmental experts, in Afro freight refuse dumping is among the contributing factors to environmental degradation. From Gombe, Hassan Kohli reporting for Trust TV. And to a sad development, three people have been confirmed killed by flood, while houses, farmlands, and other valuables worth billions of naira were washed away by heavy downpour that lasted for three days in villages and communities across three local government areas of Bochi State. The Director General of the State Emergency Management Agency in Bochi, Masood Aliyu, who gave the confirmation during the assessment and sympathy visit to affected communities of the state, with state government delegations led by Secretary to the State Government, Barrister Ibrahim Kashim. Aliyu further disclosed that the flood has also displaced thousands of people and rendered them homeless with means of livelihood, domestic animals and farmlands destroyed in the three local government areas of Katagum, Shira and Gyade. The committee visited Gyade local government area to assess the damage caused by the flood, particularly the Gyade Shira portion of the highway, which was completely washed away, rendering it impassable. The team also inspected the Gyade Azare State Road, the Azare Jamare Federal Dual Carriage Way portion of the Kano Meduguri Expressway, also cut off. The committee thereafter presented relief materials to flood victims across three local government areas. The Kano Zono Command of the National Agency for the Prohibition of Trafficking in Persons has received 12 rescued victims of human trafficking. The agency's Zono commander, Abdullahi Babale, stated this on Tuesday in Kano, while receiving the victims rescued by the Kano State Police Command. Babale said the state police arrested three suspects 
Shafiyu Salisu, 25, Rebecca Debayo, 22, and Mujibat Olagoke, 27, in connection with the trafficking. The victims were rescued along Sanyawa Federal Highway, Kano, by a team of policemen attached to Sanyawa Division on their way to Libya for labor exploitation. The ZANU commander appreciated the Kano State Commissioner of Police, Salman Dogo Garba, for his cooperation, while assuring that the suspects would be charged to court upon completion of investigation, he called on parents to protect their children from being exploited and lured into slavery in the name of seeking greener pastures. Babale urged the public to report suspicious cases of human traffickers and trafficking in their respective communities to appropriate authorities for prompt action. Some experts have revealed that unless government addresses youth unemployment and check the poverty rate, it may be difficult to eradicate human trafficking in Nigeria. They also spoke on some of the challenges in addressing human trafficking in the country, as well as recommendations on the way forward. The report. Nigeria has been designated as a Tier 2 country in the 2024 Trafficking in Persons report by the U.S. Department of State, a position it has maintained for 13 years. This may likely be due to several cases of human trafficking offenses in the country. Reacting to the country's persistent ranking, a former Comptroller General of the Nigeria Immigration Service, Mohamed Babandidi, among other experts, say Nigeria may not make significant progress without addressing the root causes of human trafficking which, in their opinion, are poverty and unemployment. I think we need to do more than just uh, law enforcement action, more than campaign. Uh, we need to improve the life. Politicians need to invest in the life of the people to ensure that people have jobs, uh, people can look inward rather than outside. We, our government needs to confront this problem, deal with the root causes. Because the root causes is that we have huge population and huge young people who don't have jobs, some have spent 10 years without work. So I think that ranking is correct. It's true that we have a very good agency by design, by law, which is active to fight this problem. But you will find that they don't have enough resources. They mentioned the need for a multi-directional and multi-sectoral approach to solve the problem, including infusing human trafficking education into school curriculum. Look, you, if you want to fight a crime or you find a big society problem, you have to have multifunctional, multi-directional and multi-sectoral approach to it. That's why there is need to involve the religious leaders. They have direct access to the people. Now, these people, when they climb their conflict or when they preach in the church and the mosque, they'll be able to talk to victims. They'll be able to talk to those who push them out. It's important to get that information to the uh, grassroots level and at all levels and integrate it into an educational curriculum system so that trafficking will be taught. At university today, I'll tell you, it's being taught in many universities and it's part of our, it's a crime, it's part of our criminal law and we are teaching it. But then we have to get it to secondary school where people can be in the curriculum and people can use that and educate people about that. We know that things are hard and uh, there are a lot of deception all over. And uh, if the religious people don't tell them the truth about the whole phenomenon, they will run into it. Nigeria has been ranked tier two in the US Department of State Human Trafficking Report since 2011. Countries ranked tier two are those whose governments do not fully comply with the Trafficking Victims Protection Act's minimum standards, but are making significant efforts to comply. The Niger state government has approved 50 million naira compensation for the families of victims of the collapsed mining peat in Galadima, Kogo, Shirera local government area of the state. The secretary to the Niger state government, Abubakar Gawu, disclosed this on Monday. Families of the victims had last week demanded compensation, threatening to take legal action against the state government and owners of the collapsed mine, African Minerals and Logistics Limited. The mine pit collapsed in June following a heavy downpour with scores of miners trapped. As of last week, 
14 bodies had been recovered from the mining pit. The SSG added that the state government had inaugurated a 13-man committee to oversee the disbursement of the funds to the victims' families. And to security matters, no fewer than five terrorists have been killed by troops of the Nigerian army deployed for counter-terrorism operations in the Bama local government area of Baroness State. The troops, in addition to killing the terrorists, recovered bombs, a rocket propelled gun, and six motorcycles, among others. The army, in a statement on Tuesday on X, also said 44 Boko Haram terrorists and their families surrendered to troops deployed at Bama, Dikwa, and Gwaza local government areas of Burnley State. The army also said the troops further arrested a notorious cattle wrestler, Mauya Shoaibo, in Plateau State, adding that a total of 32 wrestled cattle were wrestled cows were recovered from him at Maraban Kantum in Barakin Ladi local government area of the state. The suspect, who has been on the watch list of the security agencies in connection with criminal activities in the general area of Barikin Ladi, Riom, and Mangu local government areas of the state, was nabbed as the troops responded to credible intelligence on the suspect's illicit activities. In Bayosa State, the army said troops conducted raid operations into suspected criminal hideouts in Korokorosie community in southern Ijo local government area, leading to the arrest of one Donald Emerson, as well as the recovery of one revolver pistol and two locally fabricated guns concealed by the suspect. It added that troops deployed at Akinyele local government area of Oyo State arrested a suspected gun runner, Mohamed Bello, who confessed to being one of the couriers supplying arms and ammunition to Bello Chiki Dawoje's kidnap syndicate operating in the general area. The Ocean State Police Command has arrested six suspected armed robbers and recovered two stolen vehicles. The suspects confessed that they came from Lagos to rob in Ede based on information from their accomplices who reside in Ede. Hamido Yegbade, Falsin, this report. Ede, the hometown of Governor of Ocean State, Ademola Adeleke, has experienced several armed robbery attacks in recent times. Efforts of men of the Ocean State Police Command recently yielded good results with the arrest of six suspected armed robbers terrorizing Ede Town. The suspects confessed to the crime of armed robbery leveled against them by the police. When we reached the place, we saw, we met the boy, the two twins boy, and I asked them, are you comfortable it? They say yes, and that's when we call them um, uh, this um, boss that has injury in the leg, say that they should bring the gun out, then say they didn't have any gun. So the guy say they should bring the key of the car, named Venza. It's the Venza and there are four phones. Now they will take from the room. We collect almost like seven phones from them iPhones and uh, death no dear. The same day the thing didn't work out, so we are on the way to go and lodge in the hotel. So that tomorrow we'll continue. Then police now intervene. Call two of us. And one run away. We'll call, the name is called Mosulu. He's holding him that know everywhere in the day. It's him that normally call us to come. So I have been in this place three times. Okay, I would, I would, I so we robbed one woman like that. The last one I came with them was uh, we. I, I took a. I took bike. I took bike from there. A uh, lady bike. So it was on my way going that I had an accident. The police public relations officer for Ocean State Police Command. Yemisi of Palola said the arrest of the suspects was a breakthrough for the police. The, there was a guy that was prosecuted from a federal police. 
he was the one that brought these ones from uh, Lagos. They used to rob everywhere, but they concentrated in Ede for some time now. They have done like six kinds of robbery in Ede. The same mode of operation, that's what they used. It's only God that just helped us. We were able to arrest one, and that arrest led us to other arrests before we can get all of them. And we were able to recover uh, some of the vehicles that has been you know that has been stolen the police spokesperson said the suspect will be prosecuted while assuring the people of the state of safety of their lives and properties amid oye Bade, trust tv news Oshobo. the national council of state has commended security agencies for effectively containing the negative effects of the hunger protests which shook the country in the last two weeks. The council, which is meeting for the first time in the present administration, also gave a vote of confidence in President Bola Tinubu. Kainte Amodu reports. Two former presidents, Muhammad Buhari and Goodluck Jonathan, are physically present at this meeting of the National Council of State. Two former Chief Justices, Mahmoud Muhammad and Alpha Belgori, are also in attendance. Others are said to have joined the meeting through Zoom. The Council has been briefed about the security situation in the country, especially in the wake of the recent hunger protests. We did inform the Council of State, you know, about the pre, core, during and post events of the last protest, uh, which I do not call a protest. I call a movement to effect a change of regime by force, which was also resisted. And so, you know, the council thanked Nigerians at large for resisting any unconstitutional move to change government. If anybody is not satisfied with the government, any current administration, there's always an election coming. So you wait for election and cast your vote the way you deem fit. Despite the general disquiet and the discontent with President Tinumbu's economic policies, the council has chosen to pass a vote of confidence in his administration. Governors who are also part of the council met separately with the president and also passed a vote of confidence in him. There was an executive session between members of the Nigerian Governors Forum and Mr. President. And um, frank and fruitful discussions were held between both parties. And I'm glad to say we're on the right track. And um, at the same, in the same vein, members of the NGF also, like the members um, of the Council of State, passed a vote of confidence on Mr. President. Um, the Minister of Finance, who also briefed the Council, is giving assurances that despite the discomfort, the economy is in broad terms growing. He is insisting on an optimistic outlook for the Nigerian economy and the Nigerian society in general as a result of prospects for economic growth and economic progress. In terms of payments in particular, the trade balance and the current account balance are in surplus. The exchange rate is stabilizing. And inflation, though high, uncomfortably high for, uh, for the liking of Mr. President and his team, it is slowing and it is set to fall. But in particular, there has been support for the economy from investors, foreign investors by way of portfolio investors, domestic investors who are participating in important private-public partnerships. Seven ministers made individual presentations to the council to warrant that vote of confidence. Despite the council's impressions, government still has a lot to do to convince the people that voted it in that these successes on paper will eventually impact positively on their lives in real terms. From State House Abuja, Kainde Amudu, Trust TV News. Meanwhile, President Bola Tinubu has signed a bill for an act to prescribe the salaries, allowances, and fringe benefits of judicial office holders in Nigeria and for related matters into law. This was disclosed in a statement on Tuesday by the Special Advisor to the President on Senate Matters, Bashir Lado. 
recalled that the National Assembly had passed an executive bill transmitted to it by President Tinubu to increase the salaries of judicial officers by 300% in June this year. In the statement, Lado described the signing of the bill by the president as a landmark achievement and a manifestation of his unwavering commitment to the welfare of Nigeria's workforce. The federal lawmaker also urged judicial office holders in the country to redouble their efforts in ensuring that justice is served speedily. The Association of Senior Civil Servants of Nigeria has threatened to cripple the activities of states that refuse to implement the 70,000 Naira new national minimum wage. President of the association, Shehu Mohammed, issued the threat Monday during the association's fifth quadrennial delegates conference in Lagos, where he emerged as the new president. He urged state governments to implement the new wage to improve the standard of living of their citizens since the incomes of state governments have continued to rise following enhanced allocation from the Federal Account Allocation Committee. Mohammed urged that states could achieve this by reducing wastages and blocking leakages of government funds, advising states to embrace the policy of indexing income to correspond with the rate of inflation. You're watching the news hour tonight on Trust Television. Still to come. Benue youth adopt community service to improve infrastructure. We'll bring you more news on return. Do stay with us. Okay, thank you so much for staying with us. Let's have another look at some of our top stories. You heard that five more bodies recovered from Riva Rima days after a canoe capsizes with over 30 passengers in Sokoto State. Gombe confirms diphtheria case, urges vaccination amid residents' concern over indiscriminate waste disposal. And two more stories. As Nigeria joins the rest of the world to mark this year's World Organs Donation Day, experts at the Aminu Kanutishin Hospital are urging Nigerians to imbibe the spirit of organ donation in order to help save lives across the country. Addressing journalists at the Dantata Dialysis Center of the hospital, doctors also told Kano residents that the center does not buy organs, but rather encourages people who may wish to donate to do so. Today is 13th August 2024. It's a day set aside for World Organ Donation Day. Today is celebrated worldwide to create awareness on the importance of organ donation to save human lives uh, and also celebrate the heroes, people that donate their organs to save lives of others. And it's also a day that we use the opportunity to encourage the public to become organ donors. I'm here to make some public alignment on some of the people in the society that used to come and meet us and because I don't know the, 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 the source of information where they get their views that we buy and we sell kidneys here in AKTH, which is a very wrong information. So many people who came and contact me looking for how to sell their organ. And to politics. Key figures in the Kasina State chapter of the People's Democratic Party have sharply criticized the party's national leadership, accusing it of allowing unpatriotic elements to infiltrate and sow discord within the party. They warn that if these issues are not addressed, they could jeopardize the PDP's chances in the 2027 general elections. The Kasina PDP stalwarts pointed to certain forces in Abuja who the claim are plotting to hijack the party with the intention of backing President Bola Ahmed Tinubu in 2027. These concerns were raised by the party. Ch party chieftains in separate interviews with Trust TV News. Abdullah Yamari completes the report. Mustafa Inwa and Senators Ori have expressed concern over what they described as a coordinated effort to silence the opposition People's Democratic Party, PDP, nationwide. 
They claim that those behind this scheme are doing so to benefit the ruling All Progressives Congress APC in the 2027 elections. They further alleged that the PDP has been in turmoil across Nigeria since a few months after the 2023 general elections, but assured that those responsible for the crisis will soon be disappointed. People are controlling the party from somewhere, and they have recruited people who they should work for them. And they don't reason, they don't see reason, they don't understand, they are not concerned about the party. If there is anybody holding a PDP transom, is weaker in his group. Why? Because Damagul led the, led the National Watching Committee, is being guided by the, the FC minister. Regarding the parties, ward, local governments, and state congresses in Katana, Mustafa Inwa and Senator Sauri have accused a few individuals loyal to the 2023 governorship candidate Yakubu Ladu Damariki of illegally hijacking denomination forms. They claim these individuals who have little or no genuine interest in the party have disappeared after seizing control of the process. So what the National Watching Committee said, they are going to give one one form proposition. So we complained, we went to the national headquarters, we discussed this issue with them, they promised that these forms are going to be sold to each and every person who ever wanted it. Only a group of one person was given the forms. The entire form was 7,000 plus for all the wards, for all the local government and for the state. And do you think this is possible? Can this happen? This is PDP. While responding to insinuations that there is serious pressure on Mustafa Inwa to go back to the ruling All Progressives Congress APC. The former secretary to Kazanus State Government, looking so offset, it, said that will be the worst decision he will never make. He also lamented that the APC government has thrown many Nigerians into deep economic ditch, with many struggling to survive the harsh economic predicament occasioned by hyperinflation, fuel subsidy removal, and exchange rate unification by the federal government, to mention but a few. In the present day situation in Nigeria, you don't even need to remind people of what uh, uh, things that are happening because everybody is a victim. You cannot tell me people don't know how things are going beyond the reach of ordinary man, including the middle class. You cannot tell me that, especially in our areas, how the insecurity situation has worsened. Both Mustafa Inwa and the former National Secretary of PDP, Senator Saudi, however, piqued the conversation by addressing a critical national issue of local government's autonomy, calling on President Bola Ahmad Tinibu to ensure its full implementation, affirming that it's the only way to make life much easier to the people of the, at the grassroots and help reducing insecurity in the country. So one of the issues that the, local, the state government should be, and I said it about two or three times before, they should allow local government to operate their money. Believe me, they will relieve them of quite a number of these problems that are happening. So we have everything in Nigeria, but the problem we have is bad governance. How do we end it? You can end it if you have a listening government that can sit down with you, listen to you. We in the opposition, we will tell them. They however advised governors, especially in the north, to as a matter of urgency, focus much attention on removing economic barriers on education, health, water supply, and embark on human capital development rather than white elephant projects, at least to rescue the region from imminent collapse, as well as an ending crisis. Abdullahi Ismayamadi, Trust Television News, Kazana. Stakeholders in the education sector has raised concerns over the rise in the number of students dropping out of schools in the southwest states of Oshun, Oyo, Ogun, Ondo, Ekiti, and Lagos. While teenage pregnancy was identified as major driver of school dropout among girls in the region, financial constraints is said to be inhibiting boys from poor homes 
from completing their education. Hamido Yegbade files in this report. Every year, a large number of students drop out of school worldwide with Nigeria having its first year. According to the Multiple Indicator Cluster Survey conducted by the National Bureau of Statistics in the southwest states of Oshun, Oyo, Ogun, Ondo, Ekiti, and Lagos, about 60% complete primary school, but the transition rate into secondary school is less than 50%. The school completion rate in the Southwest is 92.6% for primary school, 85.3% for the lower secondary school, and 72.9% at the upper secondary school. However, the main issue is those children that are in school, are they being retained? Are they learning? Or are they completing and or transiting from one grade or from one grade to the other or from one level of education to the other? Based on our own data by the Ministry of Economic Planning in Lagos State, we have well over 4.5 children out of school in Lagos State. And don't forget, every day people come all over Nigeria, coming to Lagos without going back, most especially the, the children. Um, however, a number of um maybe strategies should be used because it cannot be just one approach uh, and it will vary from state to state um, depending on what what the peculiarity is in that state meanwhile stakeholders in the education sector from the six states have come together to find a lasting solution to the menace the focus is to support this the six states within the zone to develop a model that they can use in their states to address the key drivers of dropout, to ensure that every child who enrolls in school actually moves from one level to another and is able to complete secondary education in a, in a, in a, in a, in a progressive progression that shows that this child actually stays in school. The government needs to be very intentional you know, in addressing these issues of out of school and then addressing education quality as well. What it means is that government must intentionally invest more in teacher training government must invest more in infrastructure government must invest more in data government must also invest more in in the area of supervision and quality assurance the stakeholders said they are committed to efforts that will ensure that no child is left behind in education amid ojig bade trust tv news Oshogo. Nigerians have long been accustomed to a culture of entitlement, often focused on what citizens can gain from the system. However, this mindset is gradually shifting in Makodi, the capital of Benue State, where youth are now taking proactive steps to provide services traditionally expected from the government, viewing it as a form of community service. Jimmy Azande tells us more. One of the significant challenges facing Makodi as an urban center is its poor road network. Underdevelopment and inadequate planning have rendered certain streets impassable during the rainy season, hindering vehicular movement. In response, a new movement has emerged where youth in various communities are stepping up to take responsibility for fixing their streets, viewing it as a collective duty to improve their neighborhoods. As youth, we also have impact in the society, not just for other social or other things, activities to do, but can also try to make sure that our community are safe, our roads are good, and maybe other things also are good for people to kind of like maze of them, but once our roads and our streets are safe, it's been a while here, you see there's erosion, if you look around, there's erosion, so we are trying to like, try to fill in the potholes and the places that have washed away so that Cars and bike can also pass. Many blame town planners and developers for their unchecked construction of building, which they say is contributing to the persistent flooding pass of Makodi. If you look at it, there are no drainages. There are no drainages. And from the way they are built, I don't see any possibility of they do not even have any intention of constructing drainages. And without that, that is it's because of um, erosion. That's why they always get this. So if there were some kind of like drainage canals, then we wouldn't have had this kind of issue in this place, in this place now. The recent dry spell has motivated local youth to take action 
and improve their road network. They argue that it is a necessity as the residents are the primary beneficiaries. You community members don't come out again because they leave the whole work for the government to come to their community and do those access roads. And as you can see, if the government does not visit your place for over years, maybe like 10, 8 days, your, the whole place will be, will be dilapidated with gullies and everything. And if you start doing your things, you no longer have to see it. The government can't come to your community and do all those things for you because it will not affect them, it is affecting us. And if you can see this thing is affecting us in such a way that cars cannot come in. Governor High Center Lea has pledged to repair the streets of Makodi. While construction is underway in some parts of the town, youths in flood prone areas are taking matters into their own hands, creating makeshift rules to keep their communities accessible. Jimmy Azande, Trust TV News, Makodi. Security experts in Lagos State have emphasized the need for all security agencies to collaborate and come up with strategies that will eliminate insecurity and cybercrime in the state and country at large. They have also advocated a monthly training for staff members of security agencies to address the issue of crime in the state. Victoria Tokolo files in this report as presented from our studio. Insecurity remains a significant challenge for states and countries around the world. As crime rates continue to rise, cyber security measures are becoming increasingly robust. However, security experts say to address the challenges of insecurity, particularly cyber crime, there is need for a comprehensive training of the law enforcement officers. And to also use it to inform members of the public what we are doing. So by inviting various experts in areas of our consultation for the particular week, for the particular month to talk to us, share their expertise with us, for us to be able to improve on the ways and means that we should do our work. Professor Adedeji Oyenuga, a criminologist from the Lagos State University, highlighted the need for all security agencies to collaborate in a roundtable discussion aimed at curbing the men as both at the state and at the national levels. You know cybercrime is done online. Policing online is not as easy as policing in the physical space. Therefore, we have to do offline policing. How do we do the offline policing? By ensuring that those who are going to enforce cybercrime are good at cybercrime. According to them, to curb the issue of insecurity and cybercrime in the state and country, it is necessary to provide adequate training and equip law enforcement with the necessary tools. This approach is believed to foster a safer and more secure society for everyone in the state and the country as a whole. Troops of the 5th Battalion Nigerian Army have intensified operations against, against illegal refining in River State, arresting eight suspects and seizing over 2,000 litres of condensate. The arrests were made along the Orashi River in the Ogwa Egbema Ndoni local government area, where the suspects were found transporting the illegal products on motorcycles. In a statement on Monday by the acting deputy director of 6th Division Army Public Relations, Lieutenant Colonel Danjuma Jonah, the operations are part of a broader effort to curb illegal bunkering and environmental degradation in the Niger Delta region. Lieutenant Lieutenant Colonel Danjuma further stated that in a related operation, troops of the 63 Brigade Nigerian Army, supported by other security agencies, dismantled illegal refining sites along the fringes of the River Niger near Ndokwa East and Ndoni local government areas in Delta and River states. The Nigerian Army urged residents of the affected communities to report any criminal activities to security agencies stressing the significant environmental hazards posed by these illegal operations. It's time now to join Yusuf Akogu for the business news. Welcome to Business News. I am Yusuf Akogu. 
Credit facility by Nigerian banks to the nation's manufacturing sector rose by 53.71% year-on-year to 8.7 trillion naira in the first quarter of 2024 from 5.63 trillion naira in the same period in 2023. This represents an increase of 3.04 trillion naira. Available data from the Central Bank of Nigeria, CBN, showed that the manufacturing sector was the third highest recipient of banks' loan in Q1 2024, trailing only the oil and gas and the general sectors. The PES Bank reported that the total banking sector credit to the Nigerian economy in the quarter was 53.2 trillion naira, indicating that the manufacturing sector received about 16.35% of the total loans within the period. The report also showed that the sector grew by 1.49% during the quarter, which represents a 0.12 percentage point drop from the 1.61% growth in Q1 2023. As Nigerians await the National Bureau of Statistics, NBS, to release July inflation rates, a senior financial market analyst with FXTM, Lukman Otonuga, has predicted that Nigeria's consumer price index will drop to 33.4%. He disclosed this in a note on Monday about his expectation for the week. Given the CBN aggressive approach towards rising rates, he said sign of a cooling price pressure will be a breath of fresh air for customers. Central Bank of Nigeria has raised NPR by a whopping 800 basis points in 2024 to control inflation. NGS closed Tuesday's trading in red as BS continued its dominance in the equities market. Let's see how it went down. Leading the losers today's Owando PLC down 9.97% to close at 40 naira and 20. Cover per share of Computer Warehouse Group CWG also down as well. 9.76% to close at 5 naira and 55. Cover per share of course, Livestock Feed also down as well. 8.10% to close at 2 naira and 27. Cover per share of course, this has dragged down the market down by 0.5%. Volume of trade there 599.246 million shares they are valued at 13.916 billion naira in a list of 11,237 did exchanges among investors this Tuesday of course in terms of uh, uh, top trading equities by volume Jitco leader to be 1.99 million shares traded Japo Gold 69.62 million shares of course Access Corporation 66.30 million shares it also traded at the close of business this Tuesday of course some equities recorded gains uh, leading that uh, table is Mikio Mikio gained 9.98 percent to close at 9 naira and 37 copper per share of course 9 million also up there 9.90% to close at 2 naira and 11 copper per share. Of course, Champions PLC also gained 9.75% to close at 3 naira and 4 copper per share there. And that's the highlight of stock trading as it went down this Tuesday on the floor of NGS. Let's see the global stock market and exchange rate data for today. <music> Prices were stable on Tuesday after five straight winning sessions. A supply risk posed by a widening Middle East conflict were tempered by demand concerns a day after OPEC cut its forecast for demand growth in 2024. At the London market, Brent cool sells for $81 per barrel. For the OPEC basket, price studies at $78 per barrel. And that's business. I am Yusuf Akogu. <music> Yusuf Akogo with the business news. Thank you so much for that. President Bola Tinubu will on Wednesday, August 14, depart Abuja for Malabo, Equatorial Guinea on a three-day official visit to honor the invitation of President Teodoro Obiang Nguema Mbasogo. Special advisor to the President on Media and Publicity, Ajuri Ngalale, in a statement, said President Tinubu is expected to meet with the Equatorial Guinean President at the presidential villa on arrival where meetings will be held between the two leaders and agreements, particularly on oil and gas and security, signed. According to him, 
The president will be accompanied on the trip by the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Ambassador Yusuf Tugar, and other members of his cabinet, who will be involved in the signing of agreements and review of opportunities to improve bilateral relations. And away from Nigeria, the death toll from a mountain of garbage, the collapse in Kampala, has risen to 25. With no hope of finding survivors, a minister said on Tuesday, the huge mound in the Ugandan capital's northern district of Kitezi collapsed on Saturday, burying people and livestock. Heavy rain has hampered the rescue effort as excavators churned through the garbage. President Yoweri Museveni directed the Army's special forces to help in the search. A 200-meter buffer zone has been created around the site with residents ordered to vacate. The 36-acre landfill was established in 1996, according to local media, and takes in almost all garbage collected across Kampala, about 1,500 tons a day. Kampala Mayor Arias Lukwago said authorities were looking for alternative dumping sites because of the closure of the Kitezi landfill. Slender Foreign Scene, the African Union's health watchdog, on Tuesday declared a public health emergency over the growing Mpox outbreak on the continent. The outbreak has swept through several African countries, particularly the Democratic Republic of Congo. According to CDC data, as of August 4, there had been 38,465 cases of Mpox and 1,456 deaths in Africa since January 2022. A statement by the head of the Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Jean Kasea, said the declaration is not merely a formality, but it is a clarion call to action, adding that the continent can no longer afford to be reactive, but proactive and aggressive in its efforts to contain and eliminate the threat. Let's now join Adeni Agishafe for the latest in sports. The Gumbe State Athletics Association has initiated a horn for talent move with the Inter Secondary School Athletics Competition, planned to hold on 29 September 2024 at the Pantami Stadium in Gumbe. A statement by the organizing committee chairman, Ameg Tribu Gara Gumbe, expressed delight at the level of progress made by the subcommittees ahead of the event, including the presentation of a letter of approval by Subeb Gumbe, Educational Secretary and Minister of Education. The secretary outlined areas that needed urgent attention to include toilets and the urgent need for environmental sanitation to fumigate the Games Village. 29th of September 2024 was accepted and approved as a date for the opening ceremony of the first Gombe State Inter-Secondary School Athletics Championship. The communique also includes the appointment of Assistant President of Police ASP Jaro Usman of the Nigerian Police Force at the Substantive Camp Commandant, as you said by Ibrahim Ishiak of the Nigerian Security and Civil Defense Corps. And in basketball, President of Nigerian Basketball Federation, MBBF, Musa Kida, has confirmed that Arena Wakama will be retained as the head coach of D Tigress following their historic run at the Paris 2024 Olympics. Kida praised Wakama for her leadership, noting her achievement, including leading T Tigress to victory at the 2023 Afro Basket and Security Olympic qualification. Kida highlighted the team's strong preparation and strategic planning, noting the blend of new and experienced players that contributed to their success, hence the need to retain its coach. When Wakama was recognized by FIBA as the best coach at the Olympics. That's Sport News. I'm Abdeni Aji Very well then, that's all we have for you tonight on News R on Trust Television. Do not forget, you can always follow us across all of our social media platforms and also join our YouTube live stream for more news programs and documentary. I am Aisha Salihu. Thank you so much for watching. Have a good day. From the Daily Trust News Center, this is the News Hour.